This is Robert Clotworthy, the narrator of The Curse of Oak Island, and I have a question for you. Could it be that you are listening to The Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream? This is a top pocket find, mate, for sure. Hey, everybody. How you doing? A top pocket find for sure. Hey, uh, welcome and, and uh, glad you're here with us today, this afternoon. And I uh, want to uh, say hi to my uh, co-host over here, Jack Campbell. How you doing, Jack? I'm doing good, Jeff. And out there in the chat, of course, we have Linda Simpson doing her hard work, as always, keeping up with everything that's going on in, in our chat today. Um, and I tell you what, I, I as I, you guys have heard me say this many times, I am so excited about uh, the show today because we have such a special guest coming on, uh, Mr. Robert Clotworthy, and he has uh, such a long, long list of, of uh, accolades and, and just achievements and things that he's done, the shows that he's been on. It's going to be a great afternoon. I want to say real quick, too, for those of you that are out uh, and are viewing on YouTube, I would like to say for you, thank you for being here with us. We appreciate you as well. And those of you that are watching on Twitch, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, right down there in the corner, you have that subscribe button. If you would be so kind to give us a subscribe on there to the show, it kind of lets us know what uh, who's watching and what we can do to make the show better for you. And also, if you if you like, uh, give us a thumbs up and let us know that you like uh, what's happening and the, the content that we are bringing to you. We appreciate that very, very much. And uh, without further ado, I would like to bring in our special host. Uh, this man, as you know, uh, we hear his voice so often, you're about ready to hear it. And I want to bring him on right now to uh, Mr. Robert Clotworthy. Welcome, sir. I'm glad to well, have you. Well, all I can say is, is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> and more wood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we had more wood. Oh, wood, more wood. And the money pit. More yeah. wood. <laughs> Old wood, young wood, good wood, all it's all kinds of wood. Yep, absolutely. So it's, a, it's a pleasure wood, yeah. to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, we're glad you're here. And, uh, you know, Robert, I, uh, I wanted to say, you know, after reaching out to you a while back, I had uh, started with uh, just reaching out to you, see if you would do uh, a little voiceover for us, which you did, and everybody mm -hmm. just heard that um, play, and that's just wonderful. But you immediately came back with, um, you know, I would love that come on your show and talk to all your members. And I was completely blown away by that. I, I was, that was completely unexpected. <laughs> um, but what an honor. I thought, oh my gosh, he, he's saying he'll come on the show. And I, I didn't have to beg and plead and <laughs> all of that. But thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's part of the, uh, the, I don't want to say part of the job, but it's, it's something that I enjoy doing because it's, it's very unique and very rare that something like the curse of oak island happens it's a show that i don't think anybody thought would really take off it, it, to the extent that it has and now we get three million people tuning in each oh, and every yeah. week we have these uh, uh podcasts like like yours that are dedicated to the show mm -hmm. and i think it's incumbent on on us to participate to to uh uh, you know, interface with, with the, with the fans a little bit, have a little conversation. And I actually look forward to it. So this is, this is not a burden to me. This is something I really, really enjoy doing. So one well, thing I really yeah. want to know, when you first got the first script, episode mm -hmm. one, season one, and you enter and you, you did the whole routine and everything, and you came out, did you have that feeling right off the top that, boy, this is something really take off? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because the, uh, the, production company that does Curse of Oak Island, I've been working with for a lot of years, probably 15, 16 years now. Um, I do Ancient Aliens with them, the same production company, and I've done quite a few different documentaries. So when they presented me with with this and brought me in, I think we were only going doing maybe five or six episodes, the, mm -hmm. the initial one. And I remember the, first year. the, uh, the director that was was doing it was kept saying, "Oh God, I can't imagine this thing's going to go you know, <laughs> one or two seasons." And I went, "I, well, I don't know. We, 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 we might surprise you." And it just resonated with with the fans so much. I mean, I I really do enjoy the show. I think the uh, part of the magic of it is the relationship of of Rick and Marty Lagina, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that this is completely genuine. This is this is something that these two two men have been dreaming of since they were they were kids 
-hmm. And now they were in a position where they could actually fulfill this childhood fantasy. And I think everybody has got it in them that they've, you know, wanted to search for treasure. You go and you look in the backyard or you dig holes or whatever the heck it might be. Probably. And they're able to do yeah. it on a scale that just <laughs> has taken it so big. Yeah, and uh, but but I think at the core is the fact that it's these two brothers and their relationship and what they're what they're trying to do. And it's it's a show that is completely inclusive you know the entire family i go to these conventions and the the people that watch the show are young old uh, black white green purple it doesn't make any difference right it, it's 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 everybody mm -hmm. and uh it's 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 a special thing to be a part of and my goodness to think that it's the number one show not only on history channel but the number one show on cable television tuesday night and it beats out a large portion mm -hmm. of the stuff that's on network television is amazing. Yep, it is. I know. I, I really got a kick out of the ratings tonight of the presidential election. It was the number one show besides anything else. I mean, yeah. I mean, the only thing that beats is this: is if there's some you know <laughs> news thing, uh, something big. Every some once in a while, maybe a big basketball game or March Madness or something may knock us off the top slot. But still, we're we're consistently uh, right there at, at yep. I mean, three million plus is is amazing. Amazing. Really is. You know, you had mentioned uh, I had watched uh, some of your other interviews that you had done, and one of them uh, you had mentioned something about riding the wave, and I thought, man, is he a surfer? But I think that that it kind of uh, spoke more about what you're doing right now, uh, yeah. and that just happened to be a term you use. And I got to say that for me, um, getting involved with the uh, the Curse of Oak Island and also this group and doing this show, I I kind of in a small way, I kind of know what you meant by that simply because I've been riding this wave. I've gotten to meet people like yourself uh, that I'm just blown away by that. And some of the other uh, people on the show, you know, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Taylor, mm -hmm. and we've had uh, Steve Guppel on, and Tony Sampson was on last week, mm -hmm. and yeah. we've got some more. It just, I'm actually feel blown away by the fact that I get to meet you all and hear you talk with mm -hmm. us. And just I'm riding this wave. How does that wave been for you all all these years? You've got such a list of yeah accomplishments. My goodness. Well, it's uh, first of all, I feel incredibly blessed, very very fortunate. So I think one of the keys is to have appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, but when I one of my philosophies that I have in life is is that you walk through the door that is opened for you, and a lot of people may not understand that or resist that you think you want to do a certain thing or this is what your destiny is or this is what you know whatever it is and you're knocking on all these doors and they're not opening for you i find that when a door opens if i have the courage uh, uh or the confidence whatever it might be to walk through that door generally it leads me to something that's really nice for example you guys um, you reached out to me, you wanted me to do a little cameo thing. And, and I saw that you had a, a, pardon me, a Jemmy thing. And you asked me, or I asked you, Hey, you got a podcast? Want to be on it? <laughs> sure. It's like, okay. So we, that's kind of riding the wave. It's not fighting. Yeah. It. It's, it's, it's going with it. And I found that, uh, when you, when you do that in life, at least for me, uh, it's, it's worked out pretty, pretty darn well. And I've met some wonderful, wonderful people as a result. Yep, that's exactly right. And it, it's like you said, that's the same way it has been for me. And I've just, I'm just, and like you said, blessed is the absolute word, best word to use for that, because I feel so blessed to, to have met people like yourself um, that are, you know, I mean, I mean, like I was saying before, your list of, of accomplishments in the shows, you know, everybody, we had some people asking, well, exactly who is Robert Clotworthy? And I said, well, man, you really need to go out and Google this man, because I tell you what, when you look at uh, your accomplishments in that list. It's on the IMBD or I I, IMDB. Yes. I, yes. And you look at that and it just goes scroll, scroll, scroll. That, scroll. Honest, that's, that's just a, a partial <laughs> list. And that's crazy. I mean, you were on the Waltons. I mean, uh, I yes, I was. I, you I was on the Waltons. I was on MASH. I was on uh, Lumbo, uh, Lumbo, 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 files. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's just crazy. I mean, so take us back now. You, you obviously, you know, got started, I guess you were just a, a young man, a teenager. Yeah, and, I, was, you know, I was still in high tell school. Tell us a little bit about the story about how you got started and all this. Well, uh, I was always, I want to say a, a precocious kid. Mm -hmm. I, I was pretty outgoing. 
And my father uh, was a producer of radio commercials. He worked at an advertising agency in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, you know, they'd have, you know, bring your kid to, to work day. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, when I would go, when I would go in there, uh, oftentimes we would go into a recording studio where we would have these amazing actors come in to do these commercials. Mm -hmm. So I was able to see, uh, um, you know, Dawes Butler, uh, um, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, Jerry Stiller, Ann Mira, uh, Gary Owens, um, Mel Blank, you, I think you, was you, one. You, you, you name it. All the great <laughs> cartoon voices that would come into the studio, I would be able to see them. Yeah. And they were all incredibly funny. They were sweet. They were talented. They had a great time while they were doing it. And I just, I think it just kind of allowed me to kind of fall in love with that aspect of it. So as a kid, what I used to do I had a friend of mine who lived down the street who actually had uh, a four track recorder, you know, mm -hmm. reel to reel tape recorder. And this was amazing because all the other ones only had two tracks, right? So four tracks. You could do twice as much stuff. And what we would do is we would write little sketches or scenes or plays or whatever. And we would record them and add sound effects and do all this stuff just for fun. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I found that, I kind of event, I, you know, I got, I got good at that. One of the things that I'd like to do as a kid was read out loud. I, I know, you know, I was also in athletics and doing stuff, but I really enjoyed reading and I would pick up a novel and I would just, without ever having read it before, I would just read it out loud and I would challenge myself to see if I could make sense of what it was I was reading you know, not knowing if that sentence is going to end in an exclamation point or a question mark or right. parentheses or what. So you had one eye that was kind of on the text and the other eye is looking at the end, kind of seeing where you're going. And it, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was training myself to be a, a good narrator oh. so that now when I go in to do Curse of Oak Island, I don't get the script in advance. They just basically hand it to me that morning. I'll look at the first page and I'll see whatever the dialogue may be on that first page. I'll read it out loud once to make sure that I know what the words are, that there's, if there's a pronunciation issue. I was going to say pronunciations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then I'll just do it. I'll, I'll, we usually do a, a couple of takes and if there's nothing wrong with those, we, we move on. So to do an hour episode, it may take me an hour and 15 minutes, hour 20 wow. max. Wow. So I can kind of go through it. And so I built up a skill set that allowed that set me up so that when I do have a lot of this narration stuff, because I'll, you know, I'll do sometimes two, three shows a, a week, sometimes two different shows in the same day, mm -hmm. uh, I'm able to to do it uh, and and have fun doing it. And uh, all, another reason why I don't like to look at it in advance is I like to I like the um the information that's in that particular episode to uh, I allow it to affect me. So let's say theoretically, I'm not saying this has happened. It's not a spoiler alert, <laughs> yeah. but let's say all of a sudden I'll read in there and Rick and Marty Legine have just found the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> <laughs> They're pulling it out and mm -hmm. I'll look at that and think, oh my goodness, it's there. They found it. As a fan, it, it affects me. Mm -hmm. And so what I do, what I do is I just allow that feeling to come out in the words because yep. it's new to me. It's not something that I've been rehearsing. They found the Ark of the Covenant. 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 <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not over rehearsing. I'm allowing right. it to be a little bit more, more organic. Yep. And, you know, and that's funny because, you know, and I've talked with some of the other folks that we've interviewed and they have said that that's how the show is when they're out there with the cameras, <clears throat> you know, and, and some people that I've talked to about, you know, the show, the curse of Oak Island, people have come to me and said, Oh, that show's scripted. You know, they're, they're planting things out there that are finding. I said, no. And he said, well, how do you know? I said, I just know because no. I've watched it since season one, you feel like, you know, Rick and Marty and Craig Tester and all the other guys, so you get a feel for their integrity. And so yeah. I know that when they're they're on camera, that they want to capture 
just like you said, they want to capture their experience with finding this for right now. This is the way it's happening. Yeah. So yeah. I want, that is the best way to get the real feel of their expression on, you know, right there on the spot on camera. You know, you see, you look at Rick and, you know, sometimes when, you know, and he said this on the show, even recently that when he's out with Gary and Gary's digging, you know, and he finds something and then, or, you know, they pull it up out of the ground. He looks at Gary's face <laughs> because he wants to read his reaction. You see the camera will show him looking at Gary's face because yeah. yeah. he wants that reaction yeah. that tells him, oh my gosh, this is exciting. Yeah. That translates. So I understand exactly what you mean by that. That's yeah, fast. It's just the truth. Yep. Uh, and I, and I think that people, uh, well, people do resonate to the truth. They they know when it's when it's the <clears> truth. The only thing that they may do in the show is since they're up there for you know however many months they are and they're filming basically everything, mm -hmm. they don't know what they're going to find or not find or what's going to happen. Um, and depending on what is happening, they may move around the bits and pieces a little bit so that it makes a little bit more coherent sense as far as right. building up the you know the drama to it or whatever mm -hmm. so it's not a you know it's not like a live feed that you're getting but that's that's the only thing that that we that we do but that's not being dishonest in in any way yeah. and well, everything that's happening up there is is reality you right. know well, one thing i wonder find it. of course they want to find what's there they mm -hmm. uh they hey, you talk about the relationship between your brothers it's also more become as the seasons have gone along their relationship among the whole group mm -hmm. that has been so amazing for yeah. there's no there's no ego or there's no infighting. It's hey, we're all in this together. And not only are they working together, they're friends, it seems like too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they are. And um one we get emails from fans all the time, and, and the producer told me about one email that he received that really touched him. And it was from a, a father. And he was describing how watching the show, not only are they talking about things that are, are, are interesting and that will deal with some history and the kids can uh, relate to, oh, you know, we were just talking about, uh, you know, the, the Knights Templar in school. So this, you know, or we're talking about Columbus or whatever the heck it is. And mm -hmm. they'll, they'll have that kind of historical connection. But also what, what he sees is you see people coming up with a plan. They don't always agree. They have to work within their budget and they try to do something. They have, they, they have a goal and, and they're able, and they, they're working together to achieve this goal. So it shows his children how people can work together as a team to accomplish something. And it was it was a fascinating side of the show that I hadn't really thought about. And, it, and it's and it's it's true because you see that, you know, Rick may be the guy that he wants to just stay there 24 seven, just yeah, dig, 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 dig. And Marty is the more pragmatic saying, listen, we I'm, I'm with you emotionally. I'm there, but we got to work within our budget. So let's make sure we target what it is we're going to do and have a plan and how we're going to do it. And it's. It's amazing. I, I remember in one episode, we were talking about this. Oh God, some huge machine that they were bringing in from from Korea, and it was custom made, and it was thirty tons. I mean, some crazy, huge, gigantic thing. And in my mind, I thought, how do you get that to Nova <laughs> Scotia? Not only how do you get it there, you have to order it. If it's special, I mean, you have to have it specially made, which means you probably first started thinking about this thing a year ago. Maybe it took them six months to build it. Now yeah. it's coming from, from Korea. Yep. Does it come into the West coast of Canon? Do they drive it across? Do they go, go through the, you know, the Panama canal? How does it get there? Right. It, you know, in the show, it just arrives. It, yeah. It just shows but, up. Uh, you know, I think about, wow, the logistics of all of this, what these, what these people are doing is pretty amazing. It just doesn't come out of thin air. Right. That'd be the oscillator. I think you're speaking of the I, I, oscillator. Yeah, I, I, that, uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I remember to, uh, speaking, and I did have the the great opportunity to uh, to uh, speak with uh, Vanessa uh, Lucido, and she came mm -hmm. on the show. We we had a great interview with her uh, at one point, um, and so and she talked about a little bit about that. But you're exactly right. I mean, that had to be that was an ordered. They ordered that special to come over because yeah. they wanted to put a larger case on in the ground. So yeah. they that that's what I'm thinking. And the hammer grab that would fit it. Yeah. 
uh, yeah. that's amazing that, uh, that, you know, that you like you said that that would happen. Um, you know, you were talking about, you know, so, uh, as I, uh, let me rephrase that. Let me start in the, in your history of things that you've done over the years. Um, one of the things that you do, uh, is, uh, animation voice for animation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know I was talking to my son because I heard about, you know, Jim Rayner. And I, so I mentioned Jim Rayner to my son, yeah. uh, who's 28 years old. And I said, yeah. so, you know, Hey, guess what? I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be talking to Jim Rayner. And he's like, no way. I said, yeah, <laughs> way Jim Rayner. He goes from, yeah. from Starcraft. I'm like, yes. He yeah. goes, Oh, that's exciting. He says, do you tell him that, uh, yeah, he's been kicking my butt on the game quite a bit <laughs> over the years. <laughs> so, you know, when you do something like that, mm -hmm. And you are working with a particular game like that, mm -hmm. and you're doing multiple voices. I imagine for that, how do you keep that all straight? How do you? Well, it, I mean, actually, with uh, in that particular case, I really didn't do many other voices in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, they really kept me locked into to Jim Marina. Maybe every once in a while, I do something that was really, really minor, mm -hmm. um, because Jim Rayner is so prevalent in mm -hmm. in the whole StarCraft. Uh, story and but was fascinating about working on that character a number a no, number a number one is that uh it's 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 a huge game uh it's it's got fans literally around the world millions and millions of fans in fact when starcraft 2 came out they took the jim rayner character and they painted him on the outside of a korean airlines 747 and not just like a little like drawing. I mean, the entire back third of the plane, the, you know, the, uh, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, and in Korea, it's, it's, you know, it's bigger than, I, I guess it's the biggest thing on television. These, these wow. guys that play this game, the men mm -hmm. and women that play the game are like rock stars. Um, but what was wonderful about that is a, I got to work for a long period of time. I, I was, the original Jim Rayner. I'm the only one that's played Jim Rayner. I think the first time it came out was back in like 98 or 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And the last uh, uh, version of StarCraft uh, 2 came out maybe, uh, I'm going to say eight or nine years ago. Mm -hmm. So I played that character for over 20 years. Wow. And when they, uh, and with StarCraft 2, they really went deep into the story of of Jim and Sarah Kerrigan, which is, I guess, his his love in it. And it was this great character arc that you got to play and it had all this stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. And as an actor, it was incredibly fulfilling. And then as a, you know, being able to be that voice and then to meet the fans who were really, really affected by it. I mean, there's something very unique and very special about fans of StarCraft. Uh, there, I've never met one that hasn't been really sweet, really kind, incredibly respectful and really bright because it's not, it's not a game that's, it's not just like a first per person shooter where you just right. killing things all, all day long. It's more like chess. Mm -hmm. There's, it's, there's complexity, there's strategy, there's all kinds of things that, that come into play. And, and then you add to that, the, uh, the storyline, which is really beautiful and it's a story about love and love conquering all. And uh, it was it was an honor to to play the role. And uh, you know, people that are that are fans like your son, it it, it continues to to resonate within them because mm -hmm. Jim Rayner is a great character. He's a he's a hero. He's not a superhero. He's just a guy like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. He's got his faults, but he's he doesn't give up. And yeah. that's a that's an important message is yeah, do the is. right thing and don't give up. Right. And, you know, th yeah, it really a, is a message for all of us. Yep. And you, you had mentioned too, that, um, you know, when you're, you know, as an actor, you mm -hmm. know, and, and people think that, well, you're doing a voice well, that doesn't take acting. Oh yes, it does. And, yeah. and you know, it, it, you are, you're acting, you know, it, whether you're going to be on camera, which you've done many of those, and we can yeah. talk about any of those that you'd like to speak of, but also when you're doing a voice, you are acting. I mean, that's, it's, oh, yeah. What's, what's wonderful about it, well, A, you need to, I like to use A, B, C, D, and, and number one. It seems like I never get beyond number one or, or mm -hmm. A. But uh, as an actor, you have to, 
you have to find your your own truth. Yeah. And that's one of the hardest things for people. People think, oh, it's just if I have a voice, I can do it. Well, having a good voice, a nice voice is part of it. But you need to be able to understand who you are and allow even those ugly parts of you. I had acting coaches that say you have to expose yourself warts and all. It's it's you have to be able to be vulnerable. You have to allow whatever's inside to be viewed. And sometimes that's that's pretty scary, but it's 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 necessary if you really want to do the work. And that's that's the stuff that is the most satisfying is where you can really share with people. So when I'm working on on the Curse of Oak Island, I do approach it as an actor because I have to look at it and think, OK, what is my job here? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm in this story. What is my job? I could I could I could approach it as a skeptic. Let's say I think everything is nonsense. Or I could approach it as, uh, you know, kind of an expert about this, you know, kind of a professor. Mm -hmm. um, but I have found that for me, we have something in voice acting we, we call your your vocal signature. And I had a casting director describe my vocal signature. And, you know, as, a, as a for instance, somebody may be described as just a, a caustic pain in the neck. I mean, and that could be, you know, think, think about actors out there you know you think oh god he's 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 just irritating that's his vocal signature he's irritating maybe yep. the nicest guy on the planet mm -hmm. but he's he's kind of irritating mm -hmm. for me she said that i was i was approachable intelligence now that doesn't mean that i'm intelligent i could be the village idiot <laughs> but i sound like i'm intelligent i sound like i know what i'm talking about and the way that i say it is very approachable. It's not off-putting. I mean, I'm bringing you in to the story. I'm sharing something with you that I've just discovered. And uh, so I kind of understand that that's what the, the audience likes. That's what they hear. And I'm going to go with that. Mm -hmm. And it allows shows like Curse mm -hmm. of Oak Island for me to kind of bring you along. When I'm excited about something, I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. And let's let's discover this together. Well, I know that even when you're saying, you know, like what your, your, your favorite phrase that said on, and I'll let you say it, I'm not going to say it for you that you say on the show. And it, that's exactly, I, at least for me, it, that's exactly what you're doing is you're drawing me into that for my opinion, I think almost. Well, I also, I also <laughs> have fun with it. And I think that is a, a, a critical element that people don't understand. Um, I remember I had a, an agent way back when I was, you know, 19 or 20 or you know, I'm sounding like that was a thousand years ago, but it was, it was a long year, long time ago. But I remember he said to me once, cause I wasn't booking at, at that time. And for whatever reason, I wasn't getting the jobs that I thought I should be getting. And he said, you're not having any fun. And I thought about it. And I realized, yeah, you're right. I'm taking this a little too seriously. I've got to be proficient. I've got to be professional. I've got to be good at what I'm doing, but at the same mm -hmm. time, I've got to enjoy it. Right. And right. when I say those phrases like, is it possible? Could it be? Or what if it were true? <laughs> I, I have fun with it. I uh. enjoy that. And I know that it's it's become kind of a, a signature piece. But I think part of the reason it's a signature piece and why people keep saying that is because they can hear the fun that I'm, I'm having with it. Exactly. And, I'll, you know, they like in in other countries where they've they've they don't have my voice uh, as the narrator um, <laughs> and, yeah the, the maybe be the person may be speaking english and i'll i'll hear a little snippet of what they're saying and they'll go is it possible that gary and, Bob, and i'll go wait a minute that's that's not the way to do it. No, you got to kind of kind of give it a little bit of magic. You got to have it's got to be fun. <clears throat> you know, is it possible that gary has actually discovered something amazing. You know, it's it's like, let's, let's, is it? Oh, and if it's disappointing, it's like, oh my goodness. Oh, that's, that's sad. Don't worry, but Gary's going to, Gary, Gary will bounce back. So uh, it's, it, it's, it's, just, it's just me. I'm just, I'm just being me when, when I do it. Yep. And that's great because that's, that so translates to the screen for us all. It really does. Yeah. Who who gave you a, who came up to you to do the narration for it when it uh, first started out? Well, the the company is called Prometheus, right? And the fellow that was the uh, the uh, I guess 
the head of Prometheus was a fellow by the name of Kevin Burns. Yep. Kevin Burns unfortunately passed away yep. last year in September, and uh, it was it was a it's a it's a big void to fill. It was a big loss for everybody because he was one of those people that he he loved uh, the magic of Hollywood. Um, he grew up in Schenectady, New York, uh, studied film, actually taught film. He actually won a Student Academy Award oh, wow. for a documentary that he made when he was in college about uh, Barbara Streisand. And uh, he, he just had, he was a, not only a big personality, a big, a big man, and had, he was incredibly passionate. He wore his emotions on his sleeve. He collected crazy stuff. Not only was he brilliant when it came to filmmaking, but he collected everything from the monsters and a voyage to the bottom of the sea. Oh, and he just, he just, he had <clears throat> like Herman Munster's electric chair that, that wow. was at the, at the head of the table. I mean, he collected this stuff. So he was a fan of old Hollywood uh, and he and I were, were really the same age. We were just a few months apart so I grew up watching the same programs that he grew up watching at the same time, at the same age, which, you know, I could completely understand why he was affected by this stuff. Right. And uh, so when, when he passed, it was it was a big loss because he was so I mean, he, he understood what people wanted uh, with with ancient aliens, for example, um, people would say, what's, what's the success? Why don't you have somebody that's a, a skeptic on the show? And he said, well, if I was doing a, a, a documentary on the nativity, why would I have an atheist? It right. makes no sense. You know, let the audience decide. And he would look at these shows like, like the curse of Oak Island. And you and I discussed this earlier. It's an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he understood what the, what the hook was that would bring people in to watch the show. And he knew that it was going to be the personality of these two brothers. Yeah. And then and then you add to that that there's this treasure mystery happening. Is it there? Was it there? Is it going? Did it what happened to it? Who and that it there? Kind of hooks yeah. into what everybody, you know, is yeah. is, you know, everybody, you know, if you play the lottery, you're you're yeah. you're hoping to to get gold, right? I mean, isn't yeah. that what it's all about? And uh so, it, and he understood that it's the journey, not the destination. Even though you're somewhat frustrated, oh, they haven't found the big item yet. Well, mm -hmm. that's the way life is. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't always find the the big thing right away. It, right. And it will surprise you. If you lose your keys, you don't <laughs> stop looking just because you can't find them. You stop looking when you do find them. Right. So exactly. uh, he, he was a great influence. I worked with him for a lot of years. He He, he called me his good luck charm. It seemed that whenever he and I were doing a, a, a show together and we did a lot of shows, they became incredibly popular. They were yeah, you fans. knew him before Ancient Aliens. That was well, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, the first of actually <clears throat> the first thing that we ever did together was a documentary. It was a two hour documentary on the making of Star Wars. Oh wow, yeah. And it was actually nominated for an Emmy. It was called Empire of Dreams. It was a, a two hour bonus disc that was included with the original DVD release of the first three Star Wars films, you know, four, five, and six. Right. Yeah. And they interviewed everybody in it. And uh, he chose me as, as the narrator. And from then he just kept using, <clears throat> pardon me, using me over and over and over again. And I've been working for his company now since goodness, like 17 years, I think wow. 1994, wow. I think is when we've, or no, 2004 when we first started. So it's, it's a long time and it's very special and very unique for an actor to have that kind of a relationship with one company and to work that long. And we're all really, really good friends. Uh, when I go into the studio and work with, with them, we always have a good time. We get the work done. We all understand how important it is. And Kevin trained us really, really well. And we're constantly challenging to 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 be better and to uh, honor honor him in that way, and right. and I think we are. I think that you know there was some nervousness as to how things would go after he passed away. Yeah, but, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, but the people that he left in charge, um, you know, are are great. 
they're they're terrific and we haven't skipped a beat and that's good the ratings are fantastic <clears throat> we keep getting renewed so obviously uh, sometimes we're, we're, yeah. we're gonna be around for a while yeah we were i know many of the um when the members you know when that when that happened when he did pass um a lot of people were worried about that they were thinking oh my goodness what's going to happen to the show now is it going to change is it going to and no we don't want it to change we wanted that same yeah. you know the way the show goes to continue on because it is popular and that's why everybody loves it so much yeah and it was because of his guidance i think you know personally yeah, well, one thing that kevin would do <clears throat> is he he was he would he would always come in and polish the script at the end not he he always there's a thing called a scratch track when they first put the show together they have obviously the narration that that is mm-hmm. that is written and somebody will will read that just to kind of get it timing to see how the show is is flowing. Kevin never wanted to hear that scratch track. Oh, really? He would only hear he would only listen to it if I did it. Um, That's interesting. So, so, so they would bring me very early on, and I would do the the rough cut. And so I I might do one episode four or five times because Kevin kept having little, little adjustments. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he was, he was great at coming in and making that little polish, that little, little thing to kind of give it a little bit of a spin or, or or change it around a little bit to just make a little bit more intriguing, a little bit more interesting. And he, when he typed, he typed with, with two fingers. He wasn't like one of those guys. He was like, literally (laughs) like this. It was amazing that he was able to knock out as many shows. And, I, I call myself when I go into the studio the last line of defense. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, if I say it and it's recorded, it's 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 out there. So I've got to make sure that it's right and it's accurate. And I've I've caught a, a few mistakes along along the way, okay. and with and I've I I can tell when Kevin made a little uh, a polish to it could a would say on the script but i have to say the scripts that have that that have been coming in i feel kevin in the scripts there he's his influence is still there uh so i think the quality is incredibly high and i and i and i point to what we were able to do during this pandemic year on both Curse of Oak Island right. and Ancient Aliens that we had, like with Curse of Oak Island, it was up in the air as to whether they were going to do any shows mm-hmm. and because yeah. they were you pulled were, up. It was, they, they weren't able yeah. to get there, I think, until June or July. Then there was, uh, you know, two weeks of quarantine and, and they couldn't get, you know, couldn't get equipment. So all the plans that they had, they had to kind of reimagine. Yep. And yeah. I think that this season is exceptional what 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 they've been able to do and uh accomplish in a shorter time frame is amazing and with ancient aliens the fact that these guys who would normally be flying all over the world like Giorgio Sukulos yep. usually travels 26 27 weeks a year i mean he's never around he's constantly yep. going off to different spots on the planet and they realized we can't do that so they decided to do a round table let's let's turn it to where it's a kind of a peek behind the curtain, see how these these people operate, see that they all don't just think alike. Sometimes they have differing opinions. And I found it to be incredibly exciting and interesting. So the producers at Prometheus have done a phenomenal job. And next season for these shows, just you wait. If the uh, restrictions are, are letting, uh, being let go a little bit, uh, the sky's the limit. It's, yeah. and, uh, and, it's, it's, it's been an honor. So they, they've done a great job. Yeah, they really have. And that's something that's very important to us. Did you go ahead, Jack? Did you, did the co- production company come up with the thought of the Beyond Oak Island? Where did that come from? I'm Beyond just Oak kinda, Island? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beyond Oak Island. Um, Where did it come from? I, mean, I, who? I, I think that was, I think that was, was Kevin's idea. Cause we're still utilizing a lot of Kevin's ideas. And, um, you know, he obviously became good friends with, with Rick and Marty. And the show is obviously incredibly popular. The network wanted to expand beyond just the Curse of Oak Island. They wanted something else because, I mean, let's face it, when something is that popular, you want to <laughs> capitalize yeah, well, on it. Well, get it while it's hot. Yeah. yeah. So, so I know with 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 Beyond Oak Island, it went through <laughs> several 
uh, ideas as, uh, as to how the, the format was going to work. It took a little bit of time, basically just to figure out how it was going to flow. Mm-hmm. But the but the idea was there. I mean, I think maybe originally they were going to have Rick and Marty go out in the field more, and then they realized, no, that's not that may not work. Why don't we bring people in? And 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 I think the format that they've got now is 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 really solid. And I I think that uh, that Matty Blake um, is 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 really really great on, on the show that he does. I mean, all these these elements have really kind of taken it to the to the next level, yeah. and. Um, you know, I'm sure they they probably are thinking about some other things they want to do, but uh, I don't. Know, but I can remember the first show of Beyond that we we saw on TV, uh-huh. mm-hmm. and Maddie was going out to the Hendricks River, if I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Hendricks Lake, and uh, mm-hmm. they showed his face with his older snakes and alligators, and, <laughs> and just to see the reaction of him, you know, the way the show flowed and everything. Yeah, Maddie's Maddie's got some courage, man. He'll he's 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 great because he kind of uh gets the action moving mm-hmm. and uh you know he's he's he, that's how he is naturally and you know rick and marty may be a little bit more reserved so you kind of go to them as the uh, as the i guess the the touchstone mm-hmm. because they're, they're they're the familiar faces they bring in the stuff maddie kind of drives the action and maddie's the guy i, I remember on uh well, well you guys would remember this the old the old mutual of omaha with uh, with Marlon Perkins. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Have, what, what was, I can't remember what his name. The guy who was his, you know, Marlon would stay in the studio, and the other guy would be the one that's wrestling the giant snake in the water. <laughs> so so Matty Blake is kind of taking over that, but you got to go back to 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 Rick and Marty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at some point, yeah. Yeah. That's funny because yeah, we were. It's funny because we somebody at work and I we were just talking about that not too long ago, talking about that Marlon Perkins. And then I, I was trying to, I just when you were saying, I was trying to think what's that guy's name because they always sent him Jack, down. Jack, to, it was Jack Jack something or other. I can't remember yeah. what his name is. Yeah, yeah, and he's down there fighting with this whatever it is, like with an anaconda. And you're thinking, Marlon, <laughs> and then Marlon's there with a Timex watch, just kind of. <laughs> that's it. Sitting at the desk, and yeah, maybe he puts it on a boat propeller, and then. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's that's so true. That's because and you know and 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 I have to say when I saw you know the Beyond was coming out and I was all excited and then I saw the first episode and I was like I was let down. I'm because I went into it with the wrong mindset. Uh-huh. I was looking at Beyond as being like Oak Island where they're going to be out there digging and they're going to be bringing in excavators and they're going to do this and that and it wasn't like that. It yeah. it was. And when I watched it and I, I was a little upset, like I said, at first, I was, I don't know if I like this, but then I had to change how I looked at it. It was more like some of the other shows that Prometheus has done or the history yeah. channel has on as, as being more knowledge and giving us information and teaching yeah. us about something and yeah. then showing us where that leads to. Yeah. And when I looked yeah. at it like that, then I said, okay, you know what? I'm really enjoy this. And I did. Yeah. And I'm hoping they come back. I hear they're in production and it's, oh, it is. Yeah. We're, we're going to be doing some more. That's, that's for sure. It, yeah. it showed it very well in the ratings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, like, like you said, I mean, it would be great if, if every time they're exploring some, some new treasure mystery, there's giant excavators. There, yeah, but exactly. They're, they're expensive. Yeah. So, you know, some of these people are not able to do, to do it to that level. Um, but we, touch base with him we are mm-hmm. tell you that there's a lot of stuff out there i know that uh, you know we talk about gary drayton gary drayton mm-hmm. is is he's got the magic touch it seems <laughs> he finds things he no does. matter where he is he yep. finds things and uh i, I find it i find it interesting i love i love beyond oak island i i really like the uh the format of the show and it, and it's like you said it's, it's educational it, it teaches you what 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 things are out there some of the stuff i know we've dealt with in the past on prior episodes of, or of documentaries that we've done or ancient aliens but that's just uh you know because we're starting from what we know and then we can kind of expand out right what's nice about that show is that every week is like a different topic so you've got yeah, something yeah. A little different it's not that old guy is boring by any stretch of the imagination but it shows other things that are out there right and and that's the educational part of it right yeah. and when i when i right after we saw the first episode come out it was just shortly after that that i reached out to uh, christian roper and i asked him i said hey would you like to come on the show he was one of the first interv- interviews that i did last year um 
with the show with this show and yeah he was more than happy to come on and i was able to and again going back to now he was on the show more because he was at the, he was in the war room re- meeting with rick and marty and and maddie blake and then they went out uh with he went out with maddie to the lake and and talked about all that so he was on the show quite a bit um but we know still that there was so much because there's hour and you would know this better than anybody that there's hours and hours and hours and hours of footage taken and then like for the theorist on Oak Island, we see about five minutes of it, yeah. you know, and of all these hours of, of film. So that's what I wanted to give Christian the opportunity to come on here and talk about as much as he could with an NDA, but talk about as much as he wanted to or could explain to us that we didn't get to see yeah. on the show. And so he was more than happy to come on and we had a great show. I really enjoyed that. Um, and it was wonderful. So, and now, and then Oak Island took off and things have happened and we just haven't been able to get back and do, that's what part of our, our name of our, our group here is a uh, curse of Oak Island and beyond mm-hmm. and beyond is not only for the show beyond Oak Island, but also things that are a little bit outside, like the Knights Templar and, right. you know, things that we may, that are related, but not all about the show. And so this summer we're hoping that we can get back and go back over all of the um, beyond shows and then bring some of those other guests on because there's so much fascinating stuff out there that we had no idea. Jesse James and just so many oh, yeah. different things that are happening that we want to know. We want that information. And Maddie's great. We're going to have Maddie. Maddie's coming on the show next month. He's going to be oh, good. Uh, good. Yeah. 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 Maddie, Maddie and I kind of, kind of bonded. He, he interviewed me once and we really, really bonded. He's a, he's a great guy. Really he's so energetic yeah so i'm really looking forward to that show he's going to be coming on in a month actually a month i think of the third of april he's coming on and i'm i'm just ecstatic about that one too well, definitely say guy. hello for me all right I, we certainly will and he did that show um or the drilling down of course that he does yeah. and mm-hmm. he did that episode with uh, just recently with dan blankenship or dave mm-hmm. blankenship talking about mm-hmm. dan uh and dave's life and dave basically retiring from the show and from the hunt and that was one of the best shows i've seen this year i thought personally for me he did a great job and it gave us a good look at dan and dave mm-hmm. and their life together and that was just phenomenal so yeah. uh, you know that was great stuff to see that happen um one thing i wanted to do was kind of go back again and and I, and talk a little bit about um one of the questions and this was from jennifer brant had asked um, and we have uh, quite a few questions that members asked. We asked them to give hey, that. Jennifer, to how are you? <laughs> She's out there watching. Um, and she asked a question. She said, um, how did you get into voiceovers? And we've kind of talked about that mm-hmm. a little bit already. Um, and what advice would you give to someone who might like to get into something like this? I can't imagine it being easy. Uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. People ask me, uh, how I got into it. And my joke is that it's, it's, part of my, uh, (laughs) the conditions of my parole. (laughs) Uh, I, you know, I started really young. I I was really, really fortunate. You know, at at 15 years old, I started working professionally. Um, I started doing television commercials and TV shows and literally, uh, you know, the first audition that I I went on, I, I booked this, the third one I booked. I mean, it was crazy right off, right off the get-go. Very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I was really, really lucky. And are very um, talented. <laughs> uh, well, it's it's part of it is is you know some I guess part of it is talent. Part of it is is right place, right time. in the right place at the right time and yep. whatever. Uh, you know, when when I started as a as a kid actor, when I turned eighteen, I looked younger, and that was a big advantage because uh, yeah. they could I could work as an adult at that point. I wasn't restricted in the number of hours that I could work during the day. I didn't have to go to the, you know, to the studio school and I, and I was liberated from that. So I started working a a heck of a lot more. Uh, Not that I wasn't working in 15, 16, 17, but 18, you know, being 18 and looking 15 or 16, Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a big plus. Yep. Um, And with, with voice, uh, I, I, I started, you know, I had voice agents and I would do, you know, TV or radio commercials, uh, voiceover. And then <clears throat> with narration, here's an, here's the interesting story with that is I switched agencies. I was with a new commercial agent that handled me for, for voice. And it's like moving to a, to a new city or a new town 
when you move into that town, nobody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. You can be anything. You know, they don't have a preconceived notion because, oh, that's Robert. He's you know, whatever. They don't know who I am. So it was basically wide open. And one of the things that I was interested in doing was doing narration. Mm -hmm. Why? I just, you know, I just enjoyed reading out loud. And so what I did was I put together a demo of me narrating. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wrote one story because I, I like to write. I uh, found a couple of other little snippets of things that I that I enjoyed and put it together and put it on a, a demo and my agents put it up on their website. Well, within a couple of weeks, I get this call from the agent. They said, oh, yeah, they're uh, and this is from Prometheus. They're interested in using you for this uh, Star Wars documentary. I went, oh, great. Fantastic. And then they hired me. And it was a really at the time it was a. You know, even now, it was a really prestigious job and paid a good amount of money. And as an actor, I think one of the things you need to do is uh, you got to look at yourself and try to learn. And one of the questions that I asked when I get hired is, why did you hire me? Which is uh, interesting. You know, most actors think, why didn't I get the job? Right, right. Right. Well, maybe you need to ask why you did get the job, because mm -hmm. maybe you'll learn something. Well. I asked, I asked the producers why you hired me. And, <laughs> you know, the fantasy is that, you know, you put this, get this demo, they call up the agency and they say, hey, we're looking for a narrator. And the, uh, the agent says, oh, you got to listen to Bob Clotworthy. You know, he's terrific. He's great. Really? Hard. Don't, I don't know him. Oh man, he's the guy's fantastic. They're really pushing, right? It's like the old right. sales thing. Yeah. That's what you're well, hoping. Yeah. The only thing that I got right in that whole story was that they called <laughs> because, <laughs> because they called the agency and said, uh, you know, we're looking for narrators. And the agent said, well, why don't you go on our website and listen to the narration demos and see who you like? So they said, well, we went onto, onto the site and we listened. We liked you. And so we hired you. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, I went to the website and I looked. Now, at the time, if you go to an agency website, let's say, you know, it's, it's all in categories. Mm -hmm. And one would be, say, commercial men. And it would be a list, you know, like this long, this huge right. giant list, commercial men. Then it goes to uh, like promo and promo. It's a, it's a smaller list. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to animations, uh, even smaller list. Then I went to narration. There were six people. That That's what you were competing with, six. That was it. <laughs> now, it wasn't that the people, other people at the agency couldn't narrate. Right. They just didn't put together a demo. So they weren't even in the running. They didn't even realize there was a competition. Wow. So when it gets down to where you're one out of five or six, right? you got really good odds. Mm -hmm. So I, I, the lesson I learned was you need to be proactive. Yeah. You, need to, you need to do things and put it out there and see what happens. And that turned into a relationship that has lasted for 16, 17 years, wow. hundreds of hours of television, mm -hmm. just because I took that, the, the initiative there. So people ask how you get into it. Number one, you need to be a good actor. That's critical. Mm -hmm. um, on camera, you can get away with just the way you look. You either look right or you don't look right. They can work around you. If you can say the words, that, that may be fine. It's good enough. You'll, you'll work a little bit. But I have found that the people that are successful in voiceover, they're all really good actors. Mm -hmm. I worked with a guy on a movie a couple of years ago doing what we call ADR, auto automated dialogue replacement, which is really, it's, it, it, there's a skill that's associated with it, but it's not like really challenging you as, as an actor, because basically you're the guy that comes in and let's say it's a, it's a motorcycle chase and a guy gets knocked off a motorcycle and he goes, you know, he goes bouncing down the highway and then over a cliff, right? Well, they shoot the stunt man doing it, but they don't record any sound. Mm -hmm. You've got to come up with the sound of this guy falling off a motorcycle. So you got to go, oh, ooh, ah, 
I, I, you know, do that kind of stuff, right? And make it make sense. Or it'll be at a restaurant and they'll maybe have the two stars talking at the table in the front, but you've got people in the back. So you've right. got to fill it in with something. So we just go in there and go, you know, I'd like to order the, you know, roast leg of salmon. And uh, would you like some Bernays sauce on that? Just, it's just nonsense. Right. Well, this guy that I was working with, and we were just doing grunts and groans that day. It's like, oh, uh, ah, uh, uh, just that kind of stuff. This guy was nominated for an Olivier Award. Wow. Which is the British equivalent of the Tony. Wow. For his performance in Miss Saigon. He ended up, and he, I was, we became friends. I was talking to him. He was about to go to New York in a couple of weeks to reprise his role on Broadway wow. in the revival of Miss wow. Saigon. And here's the guy going, uh, ah, uh, <laughs> now, it was, it was, they were using about this much of his, of, of the available talent this guy had. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's I'll the kind that. of competition that's out there that you have to be prepared to, uh, to compete against. So you've got to be really good. You've got to be a good actor. You've got to understand who you are and what is different and unique about you. And, you know, practice, practice, practice. I've, I've right. taught voiceover. I've had a lot of people come into class. They can't get the words off the page. It's they're stumbling. Yep. It's like, you know, you got to say it out loud a lot, a lot. Read, read medical texts out loud, read Never things, that, legal th stuff, stuff that doesn't interest you yep. uh, and get, get good. Um, but you need, really need to be a good actor first and foremost. Right. And that's, that's very interesting that you say that because, you know, you look at, you know, you look at some of the very, the very popular people that are out there doing, um, you know, for, even for animation, let's say. Yeah. And, and I, and I, I always want to think about the fact of, of thinking about Robin Williams doing, uh, oh, yeah. you know, well, doing the, the, uh, the genie in the bottle. Yeah. And it, in most, most cases, I think, and I, I think I remember reading about this a little bit, Robin Williams, everybody knows his voice and everybody knows how, you know, how, elevated his voice and just i mean he put everything into it uh when he was doing his work whether it be live you know or whether it be an actor or or doing an animation like this but in most cases they would have the character and they would have the the character doing certain things and then they would do the voice to the character where i think they did more for him they did the character to his voice because of the way yeah. he was and his you know but well, that acting just comes out so much yeah uh, you know i worked with uh with robin did you really? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I worked with oh, him wow. on uh, what an honor that a movie be. called One Hour Photo, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it was it was a really wonderful experience because not only did I shoot a scene that he was he was involved in, but I was there uh, uh, for a lot of the rehearsals. They would bring me in, and I they they liked me. The the director liked me, and and I would read a lot of the stuff. I don't know if you know what a what a uh, table read is but that's where you get all the actors they yep. have their scripts and there's always somebody that's either you know reading the dialogue of, of secondary characters that are you know they don't want to pay to have some you know guard number one come in and say <laughs> you know your id please yeah you know, whatever, or whatever his line would be or some people may not be available but they also need somebody that's going to read the stage direction a little bit mm -hmm. um and so I was, I was there for quite a bit. So I got to see him work and, uh, spent some, some time with him. And he was a very naturally the way he was, was a very shy person. Really? Yeah. He was this shy, introspective, really very quiet guy. Mm -hmm. And, but I imagine that. he could, he could turn it on. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, if you saw one hour photo, he played this really quiet, reserved, almost milk toast guy that would, would you know, if he was standing against the wallpaper, you wouldn't even know he was, he was there. Um, but he was uh, he, he was an, an amazing, amazing talent. And you know, I spent a lot of time also at the comedy store. I used to see him perform all the time there. It would have been a great um, thing to see. Yeah. Him. Oh, yeah. One of the shows I wanted to ask you as you were in. Mm -hmm. Just because it was such an iconic show, you didn't do many episodes of it. It was the series of Bass. Oh, and, man, the yeah. and the characters that were 
I would yeah. imagine going around sitting around the table reading the lines was something to be oh, even, even well, with the acting. Yeah, it was it was that was pretty cool. And I'll tell you a funny story about about MASH. We shot it uh, over at 20th Century Fox. We actually shot it on the, the soundstage. And, you know, if you're on MASH uh, and you're a guest star, pretty much you're going to be a, a patient. <laughs> you know, so you're a soldier <laughs> that's that's sick yeah. from something. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I was there and it was a, uh, the, I, they, there was some kind of a skin disease that was affecting the, the soldiers where they'd get these mm-hmm. open sores all over their body. And so they, they, you know, brought me in and of course, what, what are you wearing? You're wearing pajamas and a, and a, you know, lousy bathrobe with some slippers. And then they come to you and they put all this, this goo all over your face. You looks like you got open sores, like you, you know, something horrible. And then once they get the makeup on, then they call lunch. And of course they call lunch and, you know, you're at 20th Century Fox. They're not catering it there if you're on location they'd have a caterer no you go into the uh to the commissary so of course <laughs> i'm wearing this bathrobe slippers pajamas got these yeah there it is the, you got all these open sores all over on your face <laughs> and, and i'm standing in line with my tray to get to get some food and what else are they shooting that day they happen to be shooting a charlie's angels and it was a charlie's angels i think it was a uh uh, like a bathing suit competition <laughs> show or something like a beauty contestant. So there are all these incredibly beautiful women standing in line and I'm looking like, you know, <laughs> open sores all over my face. <laughs> I thought that was pretty. Uh, yeah. Pretty <laughs> oh, that's funny. So yeah, that was- as, it, as it turned out, but I did get my revenge because I ended up uh, being the voice of Charlie in yes. the last Charlie's Angels yeah. movie. With, yeah, uh, and I mentioned that to somebody you. at 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 work. You know, I said, "Oh yeah, Robert Cotworthy he's coming on the show," and and I and he said, "Oh really?" And, and somebody did really didn't watch uh, the show or anything. Uh, Curse of Oak Island. So I was I was telling some of the things that you had done, and I said, "Yeah, he was the he was the voice of Charlie's Angels." Go wait a minute. Wasn't that John Forsythe? And I'm like, yeah. no, it was. I think it was in the movie. the The movie with, uh, you know, it, well, uh, it's it's interesting because you know John Forsythe passed away, mm-hmm. and uh, they were looking for the voice of of Charlie for for the movie, mm-hmm. and they brought me in. I auditioned and I and I got the part, and I, I amazed myself in that how closely I sounded like John Forsythe. Wow. Yeah, I had actually done Charlie's Angels before when there was a TV series, and then I got replaced at the last minute as Charlie, and uh, with by Victor Garber, and but for this, and when I listen to it back, I don't really even hear me. I hear John Forsythe. Right. So I, I was trying to 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 recreate that because it was that was what they were looking for, but it it kind of amazed me. I think that it it, it kind of surprised them at how closely i resembled his voice or how closely i got to it mm-hmm. and they expanded the part as as a result of that wow that's so great. yeah i'm i'm charlie it's just been yeah and, and that's what i was saying victor garber and me that's it <laughs> and and what a group to be in right to be yeah. included in i mean that's just yeah. fascinating yeah. to uh and what an honor you know it had to be to, to be included in that group yeah i know and i wanted to touch on another uh show that uh, you were in our movie um that i think was you know um the part that you played and the, and the scenes that you did mm-hmm. uh, were just awesome. And I, I know you had some interesting things to say, and I'm going to bring up this picture real quick. Okay. Um, and of course this is American. Oh Spirit. yes. And uh, where you play the doctor um, yeah. and talking mm-hmm. to, and, and, and being able to, to work with, and I guess on this show you're working with Clint Eastwood and also Bradley Cooper. I mean, tell us about that a little bit. It I mean, was, actually, it was awesome. pretty amazing. Um, first of all, uh, people call him Clint. I still call him Mr. Eastwood. <laughs> Mr. Eastwood does not really audition actors. He didn't like it as when he was an actor. He doesn't feel comfortable having people come in and audition. You know, he's he's a very uh, empathetic guy. Mm-hmm. So you basically film your. So you go to the casting office. They record it, film it. He looks at it. And he makes his selections. And I got the part. Like well, never met him. So imagine you show up on the set. 
and you're doing this scene and you still, and it's with Clint Eastwood and Bradley Cooper, and it's just going to be the three of you. Wow. And wow. you still have not met either one of them. Then, <laughs> and then just before I was going to shoot the scene, the writer comes up to me and he says, uh, Bradley's decided to expand the role or expand the scene. I said, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. first of all, I went, I went, uh, does, uh, you talking, uh, rewrites? <laughs> he goes, no, no, no. What he wants to do. Cause I'm thinking I memorized this stuff. Yeah, exactly. He works so hard. I haven't met Clint Eastwood yet. The pressure's on. And, uh, he says, no, no, no. They want to, uh, improvise. And to me, that was like, uh, like, like Rick and Marty Lagina hearing the words, we found it. <laughs> we found the treasure. It was it was like the answer to a prayer. And they said, yeah, because there's certain elements of Chris Kyle's story that we weren't able to show, like describing how long a uh, a, a tour of duty was, how many days he spent in country, in country, uh, how many uh, unconfirmed kills he had, you know, that kind of stuff. So I sat with the, with the writer and we came up with some some bullet points, some ideas, things that he wanted included. And then when Bradley showed up, first of all, Bradley Cooper disappeared that day. It was Chris Kyle. I had wow. actually, I'd read the book American Sniper before. I'd seen interviews with Chris Kyle. When Bradley Cooper showed up, he was Chris Kyle. He put wow. on weight, he bulked up. He looked just like him, uh, sounded just like him, had, had a Texas accent going. Even, you know, it's hard to hide those those blue eyes that, that Bradley's got. But still, he, he, he was uh, Chris Kyle. And so imagine this. Here we are in the room. It's me, Bradley Cooper, and then Clint Eastwood over there. I can't really imagine that. Honestly. You know, I, I'm looking around thinking, how did I end up in this room? Yeah. But we started doing the dialogue. And, I, I, and we didn't rehearse it, really. Really? Uh, I... I, I thought I knew what had happened prior to that in, in the movie that he kind of lost it. He almost beat the dog with a, with a, a belt. He just was having this PTSD and it just, he snapped. So he's going to a psychiatrist cause he's in trouble. Now I thought to myself, what would be the worst thing you would want to hear from a psychiatrist? Oh, the first thing. <laughs> so, and this was not scripted. This is just my idea. I said, uh, your wife called me. Oh, wow. She told me what yeah. happened at the party. <laughs> he, you know, he, at that point he knew he couldn't lie. Right. He, he couldn't BS me. And Bradley is brilliant because we we must have done that and we you know i i would add this that and the other thing and and you know we we just had a dialogue never once did we step on each other's lines and we did it maybe uh, normally clint would only do like a couple of takes but we did this more just because it was such a uh a, a critical scene in, in the movie as far as transform transformation for for chris's character right right and um so uh, bradley's character of of chris and he, we never stepped on each other's dialogue and it's, it, looking back on it, it was, even though it was challenging with the pressure was on, it was probably the easiest thing I've ever done Wow! because he was so good. He was so present. We were just having a conversation and I knew what my job was, was to kind of get the truth out of him, to get him to a certain point. Yeah. And he was willing to to trust you know to, to 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 open up and expose himself and in fact at the end of the scene as written it was i was supposed to give him a prescription for something and they we shot the the second scene prior to where i, where I take him into uh to meet the soldiers that have been wounded mm -hmm. and i realized i said giving him a, a prescription is a cop-out right. no, no 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 i gotta i gotta challenge this guy so that's why i said uh, you know, there's lots of soldiers here that need saving. I said, you want to take a walk? Yeah. You want to go? And you can see his face, you know, he, you, he, in that scene right there, you could see his face and you could see that he's kind of thinking, 
wow, yeah, I guess there are people here that. Yeah, were, yeah, and you, uh, you could see him processing that. That was yeah, so. It, yeah. it was it was Clint Eastwood's favorite scene in the movie. It was the scene that they played at the Academy Awards when Bradley Cooper was nominated for an Oscar. Wow. And it was funny when I finished the scene, I was talking to the, to the writer afterwards, and I said, you know, that scene would be a great trailer. And <laughs> damned if you if you don't if you look at the American Sniper trailer, it's primarily my dialogue <laughs> because I ask all the yeah. questions. Yep. I mean, do you ever wish you had done things or seen things or not done things and wish you had whatever that could is. So all the, all those like really good questions that I, I fired at him ended up being in the, in the, uh, the trailer. So right. it, it was, it was a great pleasure and a great honor. And uh, Clint Eastwood is amazing. He just, he's, he doesn't say action. He doesn't say cut. He just goes, go. Okay, stop. <laughs> He's so relaxed. He sets this, this, this comfortable atmosphere on the on the stage that just makes it so easy to be present and so safe to to do work. And uh, yeah, that's you know, be a Bradley Cooper was just the nicest guy on the on the planet. I right. actually met him again. Uh, I guess a few months after that, when he was working on. Uh, um, on a, on a movie and it was that he was doing the, I guess the sound editing at the same studio where I do ancient aliens and curse of Oak Island. So I was able to talk to him a little bit and just a sweet, genuine guy, really, really down to earth. Yeah. He seems that way. I, I, and that yeah. has to be something, you know, I, I say, well, you get to meet all these, you know, great actors and all that, but then again, you know, I consider you to be a great actor, not only in voice, but on, you know, on camera. So, I mean, you know, for me to meet you is just an honor, but like you said, to, to go up and meet somebody like Clint Eastwood and Bradley and, and get to know them in that respect, that has to be just a, a amazing experience for you. Yeah. I've, I've found yeah. that when you're, when you're dealing with people that are really at the top of their game, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy. You just have to kind of go with it again we're talking about going you know riding the wave just go with with the mm -hmm. flow they're already there they'll take you there they want you to be there right so and they're they they know their craft so well that you can trust you can you can work with them so um you know clint and that's what i find amazing about it again yeah. i'm available <laughs> well you're describing clint eastwood you know when you're working with him like that yeah and when he comes across on the screen is a completely different is a completely different person yeah. I mean, it's funny when he arrived on the set, I remember I was like, you know, sitting outside my trailer or something. I see this, it's like a little, I want to say it was like a smart car. It was just like some kind of like little tiny little car that pulls up and I, and I look at it, he's driving it. <laughs> and I, and I see this. I mean, he's, he's not a small guy and he's, you know, gets out of it. Like, <laughs> like I'm going, Oh my goodness. Okay. There, there's, there's Clint. There's Clint. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's there eating lunch where everybody else is. He's not hiding away. He's, he's just, he's just there. He's, he's a man. And yeah, I know I had a, a, a personal, a personal story of my own. I, I didn't actually get to meet him, but uh, yeah, I, when I was uh, a teenager, just uh, in, still in high school uh, or graduated from high school, um, we had, there was a movie being filmed. I'm from the Northern Michigan, uh, same oh. as Rick and Marty up from the oh, UP okay. of Michigan. Probably I'm on the Eastern, Eastern UP, they're a Western UP. Okay. Um, but at one point, I during the summer, what a lot of us uh, teenagers would do was we'd go to work on Mackinac Island. And Mackinac Island being a place where, you know, there's just all, it's all horse and buggy mm -hmm. um, and bicycles and all that kind of stuff. And it takes you back. Well, there was a movie that was filmed there. Uh, this was back about 1977, 78. That was called the, um, Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeves and, um, oh, I'm at a loss for her name now. All of a sudden, just beautiful woman, a great actress. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, uh, seeing what you just said, you know, being able to see them. there Now, there's no cars allowed on the island, but for the filming of this movie, they show um, Christopher Reeves driving up to the Grand Hotel in his little white convertible car. Right. And cars weren't allowed on the island, but they did that for the movie. Yeah. But we got to watch, and I was working on the island at the time. And we, Jane Seymour, thank you. Amy, uh, Amy just popped up and said, Jane Seymour, thank you. Um, but we got to see him driving around the island and talking to people in this little white car. He would do it all the time. He'd buzz around, you know, during the day because they did most of her filming at night mm -hmm. uh, in the Grand Hotel. But, you know, that experience of being able to see him and 
you know, just, oh, there goes, there, there he goes driving by. Hey, how you doing? He's waving at everybody and he's hollering and doing shot. I mean, that's just phenomenal too. And you get a sense to feel for their, their, um, their personality and that, you know, yeah. just because they're such, you know, wonderful people. It's really nice. Um, a couple of the, uh, members had asked, and, and we're going to kind of, you know, we're going to go all over the place. We've been going to Oak Island, ancient aliens and around to your, to your past. But, um, another question, Susan, um, Otterson and also, uh, Shannon public cover, both basically asked the similar question that was talking about, um, have you been able to meet many of the, the cast members from Oak Island, you know, Gary and Rick and Marty and all them? How's that? I've, I've met Gary through a zoom meeting where a couple of them were on it. Um, we were going to all meet back the early part of last year. There was going to be a, a convention in Los Angeles that Rick and Marty were going to be there. And I was really looking forward to meeting them, but mm -hmm. no, I have not met them officially yet. Uh, I look forward to that. I'm hoping I've planted the seed actually uh, last week at one of the recording sessions that I'd love to go to Oak Island. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know that Laird has, uh, uh, and he and I are, I don't know, Twitter friends or mm -hmm. you know, whatever the heck it is where, where we've kind of gone back and forth. Uh, so I, I'm hope hopeful. I'm hoping that I, that I can go up there. Cause I really, I really would, would like that. I think it would be, uh, would be, it would be a lot of fun. I certainly would love to grab a, a shovel. A shovel. <laughs> I, I think we all would. I go, yeah. I go Hey, uh, Gary, look not, what I just found. Yeah. You've met a lot of the ancient alien ones, haven't you? Oh yeah, all of us Georgia, been to many many conventions. So I know I know all them. Uh, Giorgio is is a, is a good friend of mine. Uh, Nick Pope, David Childress, Linda Moulton Howe. I mean, all all of them we've met uh, uh, at, and spent a lot of time together at at, at different conventions. And it's uh, it's an amazing group of people. It's fascinating because, well, first of all, I want to give credit to to Kevin again because he puts together an amazing cast. Mm -hmm. He's able to find these really interesting people and everybody that's on ancient aliens, all the experts, they're pretty much type a personalities. These, these, and they've got a lot of charisma and they're incredibly articulate, but yet when we're all together, you don't get this big clash of egos. All right. The, even if they have a disagreement, it's, it's this, it's a disagreement, uh, on a level that is so fascinating because they all have evidence to support their, their own particular point of view. Mm -hmm. And even when they challenge somebody, the other person's got a comeback. Right. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I get to be, I, you know, I look at myself as a little bit of the, of the comic relief when it comes to it uh, at these conventions, you know, I'm the, I'm the actor. I'm the, I'm the guy that is supposed to be comfortable in front of people. So they have me introducing everyone and uh and I, I i have like little little things that i do for 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 each and every person for uh for giorgio when i introduce him i say uh what i say i say the world no, no everyone here knows him as the uh star the, the the star or the meme of ancient aliens he's also the uh editor a uh, publisher of legendary times magazine giorgio sukalos the neck the rest of the world knows him as the guy with the hair, the guy with the hair. Yeah. <laughs> He's the guy with the hair. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And like Vic and uh, Eric um, Von Daniken, Eric I Von mean, Daniken. who basically yep. got the whole ancient aliens thing started, you know, with, with, they his did. They did. And I am a fan of that show as well, by the way. And I know several of our members are too. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's great. Hopefully, hopefully everybody's enjoying the, the round table conversation that they've got going right now for the next, uh, next several episodes. It, cause it's, it's really pretty interesting to hear these people talk. And also another good friend that I've uh, become, become close with on the show is uh, Travis Taylor. Travis, Dr. T Dr. Travis Taylor is, mm -hmm. he is truly a rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. He yep. had experiments up on the space station. Uh, the guy is, is, is amazing. Plus he was, I think he was the state champion in Taekwondo. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. He's, he's from Alabama. He, he's a fascinating guy oh. it, it, and you know nick pope you can just sit and listen to forever mm -hmm. linda moulton howe oh yeah she's amazing bad. about linda she just had her i think she just had her 
80th birthday, I think wow. last week. What's amazing about Linda is she's so articulate. She never stumbles. Really? She never says, uh, uh, uh nothing, never. She can, and she can speak. <laughs> she, she can pull dates, times out of nowhere. Wow. And keep to, you, you could listen to her for 30 minutes and she wouldn't take a break. It seems like she doesn't take a breath. It's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and that has to be so cool to me. Like you said, to, to meet all those people and, oh, and to just, be in the green room and just kind of listen to, you know, exactly. I'd be going on the table. Oh my I God. know one of them. Oh, one yeah. of our members, Brendan Dix asked, do you ever get to a point where you're doing a show or something and you just, all of a sudden you get to a point where you get tongue tied. You it, it just can't. I'll, t I'll tell you the first time I got tongue tied, you know, when I, in ancient aliens, we say ancient astronaut theorists say yes. Mm -hmm. I came to an episode where it was ancient. And remember, I don't see the scripts in a, ahead of time. It's like, right. I just look at it and say it. Okay. Ancient astronaut theorists say no. <laughs> I said, I said, I, I did this. I went time out, time out, time out. What is this a typo? Is this wrong? They go, no. And I, I had the hardest time not saying yes, because you get this muscle memory. Right. Um, but yeah, if, do I ever get tongue tied? Yeah, of course, especially if it's, uh, you know, if we're doing like back to back shows, maybe um, it's going to be four or five hour session. Yeah. You start getting a little bit tired. Uh, also some of the, some of the words that you have to say, names, places yeah. are really challenging, especially if there's four or five of them in one particular paragraph, yeah. oh then you, you know, uh, if, if there's only one, you can kind of prep for it, you know, put your little, uh, you know, do your little markings next to it. So it's spelled phonetically, but if you got two or three, then you're kind of like your eyes going here, 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 yeah. <laughs> around. But eventually, I, I get through it. And plus, you have to make it sound like you've said it ten thousand times. Right. right. Yeah. It has to be very natural. Yeah. So it's got to come out. Yep. yep. Now that's and that's I funny. The reason you know, I got the job was because I could say ancient astronaut theorists say yes. I mean, it's not that easy. <laughs> I, I honestly, and I, you know, I'm going to admit, you know, I have uh, kind of practiced that myself, actually. Okay. <laughs> From time to time, you know, and, it, and it's kind of funny, and I, I'm letting a, a big personal cat out of the bag here, but um, I will sometimes listen to you speaking, uh -huh. and I will actually, you know, I, I'll just, I, I won't watch, I'll just put my head down, and I will actually, with my microphone and hearing myself, and I will actually repeat what you say after you say it. Oh, and right. I do that with other, and, and I'm, when you, like, and you alluded to this earlier, talking about um, trying to sound like John Forsythe. Yeah. Now, when you do your own show, you're trying to sound like you. You're mm -hmm. you're sounding like a, a, a character, uh, or whether it be your own personal, you know, um, you. Would it be Robert Clotworthy, or would it be another character that Robert Clotworthy is playing? Um, you 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 want to, and I practiced doing it just like you do in the same cadence, <laughs> because there's a cadence to the way you are saying yeah. this. Yeah, there is. I practice that. You know, I I know. I just. Just embarrass myself in front of everybody. But. No, no, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Listen, I did that too. Mm -hmm. It's this. This is part of it. Is part of it is you want to learn the style. Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of and, and and it gets back to having fun with it. You're not doing this. Oh, absolutely. As a professional job. This is. I'm exploring. I'm having fun. This is. This is kind. Of, this is kind of a cool thing to do, and maybe by just closing your eyes and trying to repeat it back. Maybe something something clicks back there. All of a sudden, think, oh, or maybe you find a little something there mm -hmm. that you didn't think w was there. It's it's all part of the process of 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 learning. I used to do that all the time. I would practice what Casey Kasem sounded like. Oh or, yeah, oh yeah. You know, sure. with, with this announcer, with that announcer, what, all that kind of stuff, just to get like I, I get auditions where they want to have, uh, you know, let's say a a, a 1950s uh, uh, newsreel, uh, type voice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you've never heard that before, if you've never tried to do that before, played with a little bit, then you're going to be at a loss. Right. So mm -hmm. for me, you, you throw me something, it's like, okay, you're like a, a world wrestling federation announcer. Okay. I know what those guys sound like. Right. Okay. You're a, you're a, a broad, a TV, uh, on camera broadcaster. You're the, you're the anchor man. Mm-hmm. 
okay, I can do, okay, I can give you an anchor man. Okay, you're, you're the, uh, the reporter in the field. Okay, I'll give you the reporter in the field. And I'll, I'll give it my little spin, but it'll still sound like, it'll still sound familiar. One right. thing that drives me crazy sometimes is you watch movies or TV shows, and I, I know how it's done when they bring in a group to do ADR, and they'll hire, they'll need somebody to do a radio announcer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the character just happens to be listening to the radio, or they have the radio on in their car, or whatever, at home. And you listen to the voice, and you think, no way. That guy sounds terrible. That doesn't, there's, there's nobody, he'd ever get hired as a radio announcer. But I knew that <laughs> on the set, he was probably the closest guy to it. Mm -hmm. So he, he got the gig. Right. Um, but so I can, I can totally identify with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And part of my, part of the thing is about my cadence is just catching my breath. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, I'm, and I'm also not, not really? fighting it. I mean, I've had people that have said, Oh, you know, sometimes they'll direct me. Can you do this where it's not so broken up or emphasize this word or emphasize that word or whatever that might be. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll do that. Uh, so I'm constantly trying to challenge and, and, and and learn and, and get better but i also know that uh, you know i got to be me right uh, it's, I, so far people are kind of <laughs> liking it every once in a while i get an email from somebody that you know That's, i drive yeah. them crazy but yeah, but usually uh, if, if there's any kind of a negative comment <clears throat> this is it's it's such a sweet negative comment right is people will say and it's primarily women and they'll say we find your voice very soothing. In fact, it puts us to sleep. Oh, great. Yeah. And immediately oh, great. say, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah. And I, I I I really enjoy that because it's 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 a sweet, it's a very sweet compliment. And right. I joke and call myself vocal ambient because a lot of people just yeah. turn on the show and it's like, oh, okay. I'm good. It's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Life is good now. I can yeah. <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I know I saw it in your bio and I know you've mentioned on here before, it's kind of like you do martial arts yourself and that's yeah. kind of a relaxing form for you because you yeah. kind of describe a little bit what that is. Yeah, I did that for, for a lot of years. Um, I studied uh, Kung Fu San Su and actually became a, not just a black belt, but a, a master in it. So I guess I was a black belt. What would that be? Eighth degree, I guess, wow. if you're, you're going to turn into some kind of a number. And uh, I did it for 20 plus years and actually even, even taught it out here in Los Angeles for a while. And what I enjoyed about it was that it was, it was every time you would go to class, there was a, a new lesson. The, uh, the lessons that we were getting were actually the, the grand master at the time was a fellow named Jimmy H. Wu, whose great uncle was actually a monk in a monastery in China. And when he left China, took with him two of their books. And one of their books was of their fighting techniques. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of Jimmy holding this book. And it's, I don't know, I don't know, thousands of pages in it. I mean, it's all, you know, written on, you know, animal skin or whatever the heck it was at, at that time. And so what he would do is, he would go to that book and he'd go, mm, look at a, look at a lesson. Go, okay. This is one we're going to teach tonight. And it was fascinating because the purity of it, it was coming directly from the books. It was this, it was as if I was in the monastery in China learning the lessons. I mean, wow. it was that pure. It hadn't gone through 37 people by the time it got to me and, you know, it, and it been diluted and changed and supposedly improved or whatever. So it came to me, in my opinion, it came to me perfect because these these monks had done all the the I guess the the re, the R and D mm -hmm. on it. They were the ones that practiced it on one another. They are the ones that saw what worked and what didn't work, and then they came up with here it is here here it is perfected. And it was also not for competition. It was what I like used to call just Chinese street fighting mm -hmm. because there were no holds barred with it. I mean, everything was wide open. This is pure self-defense for self-defense sake. And along with that came responsibility, because if you're going to learn something like that, you got to start thinking about, you know, my, uh, my goal is, is, is to never use the fighting aspect of it. Because if you're smart, if you're aware of what's happening around you, you can pretty much see danger before it, Right. It comes to you. 
you know, there's not saying that there's not the, the off chance things happen. I mean, things do happen. But generally, if you talk to people who get into a physical altercation, you know, they'll say, oh, it's just came out of nowhere. Then you do a little exploration, you find out, you know, yeah, I saw the guy when he first walked into the bar and yeah, I was, I was talking to his girlfriend, you know, whatever it might be. All of a sudden there's this, there's this chain of events that lead, lead to that. And so it gave me, uh, you know, I started thinking about when do I want to use this? And I thought, okay, a lot of the stuff I don't, I'm not going to get upset about. Why do I need to get upset if somebody cuts me off in, in line? Right. Okay, sure. It's okay. You know, so I'll be 30 seconds after you, whatever. Right. Exactly. It's not, it's not worth putting the risk. And also I understood that these people, since they were monks, were very, very serious individuals. There was a philosophy that was associated with it. There was a, a, a way of life that was associated with it. And I found that very intriguing and very interesting and very, very informative and calming. So I, I loved all the aspects of it. Plus, it was a great way of, uh, of doing physical exercise. I was learning something that was practical and I was making great friends, mm -hmm. you know, to see the same group of people three times a week for 10, 15 years. Wow, that's, that's right. pretty amazing. It pretty is. Amazing. You're kind of growing up together with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was it, it, it was uh, a, a wonderful experience. And it was something that I always wanted to, to learn because I was first as a kid intrigued by the old Kung Fu show with David Carradine. Oh, yeah, I love that show. So I just, you know, and again, it was one of those doors that opened up for me. I was a member at a at a gym in Beverly Hills. It was the old Beverly Hills Health Club, which was this ridiculously old health club that had been there since like the 1940s. Wow. They even had a, a room with pouches, <laughs> you know, these big lounge chairs where there was no sound and it was very little light where these old guys would just go and sleep. <laughs> that was it, you know, they, they, they go to the sauna and they go in this room oh. and just, they just nod out. <laughs> and the, this instructor, you know, along with aerobics, they were offering this. And I thought, ah, oh, okay. Let's let's check this out. And boom. Next thing I know, it you know, twenty some odd years later. You're master clot worthy. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I took uh Krav Maga and I still oh, yeah. uh and I love that. And and like you were just saying, it a lot of it is a it's a mindset. It's a discipline of your body, but also a discipline of your mind. And like you said, they one of the things that our, our instructor really focused on was to diffuse a situation without any conflict. Yeah. Because uh, you and it, being aware of your situation when you come into a, like you said, you come into a bar or something or a room of people that might something might happen, but you just be aware of the situation. And most of the time, you can diffuse something before it ever takes place. Yeah. It's, by it's, just doing it's that. very, your life becomes much calmer because mm -hmm. you're not, Absolutely. you're not as anxious. It, right. And it could be just simple things like when you're walking down a sidewalk, when you are going around a corner, you don't cut the corner real close. You just right. you just step a, a few steps out and make it a little bit wider so you can see what's on the other side yeah, exactly. a little bit earlier. It's That's it's anyway, it's, and it's trusting your your instincts. You mm -hmm. know, if you see somebody walking to you, you just get a get a bad vibe, whatever it is, you just walk across the street and right, you know, go the other way. Right. It, it, I, I remember that uh, they told us one story. My instructor told me one story about Jimmy uh, Wu was at a at a at a beach. And he went into a, a restroom and it was stolen. He was, he was using that. And a couple of thugs came in and uh, they said, Hey, old man. And he's like, mm. yeah, he goes, uh, he goes, you got any money? He goes, nothing but money. And they said, Oh, okay. It's good to have money. Isn't it? He goes, yep. It's real good. <laughs> and he walked out five minutes later, paramedics are arriving because some other old fellow walked in and they got beat up. So wow. it's a matter of understanding confidence. You know, people that are out to get you generally are looking for a, an easy mark. Yep. Um, and if you, if you, if you look like you're, you know, act like you a, a little bit, you're not that easy mark, maybe they'll go for somebody else. Yep. Absolutely. So it's, it's little, little adjustments, just understanding what's, what's around you. Yep.
Absolutely. Uh, we usually, I, I usually try to keep these, the shows to about two hours. And I see we got about uh, t- uh, 23 minutes or so yeah. left um, before we get there. And we still have some other questions from the, the members. And I know that, sure. yeah, cause I don't like to let it go too long, but I did have this and I wanted mm-hmm. to show this. And I hope this, uh, this was a, an actual commercial that you had done. And I was going to ask you yeah. about um, this particular one has some humor in it. And I yeah. thought how, how, when you're doing the commercial, I, and I don't know, when you, you talked about your scripts that you do for the show, mm-hmm. for Curse of Oak Island and Ancient Aliens, that you don't read them before you get there, but I would think on a, I don't know, on a commercial, but I want to play this commercial real quick that you were in, and yeah. or you did the voice for, I, I mean, uh, uh, and then just kind of let, uh, you know, and then we'll talk about it when it's done. I'll, I'll run it real quick here. Um, all right. Did you see the name in there at the top? You probably already know what it is. <laughs> a lot of men. Your game may not be what it used to be. Ask your swing doctor if the new Cleveland Launcher 460 Comp is right for you. Make the change to the Cleveland Launcher 460 Comp for longer, stronger drives that go all day. <laughs> go all day. The Cleveland Launcher 460 Comp I love this. be right for everyone. In rare occasions, players have been known to stay long for more than four hours. In this case, play 36. <laughs> well, I just we, love it. Yeah, we all we all know what that commercial really was about. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and that gets back to the style. Mm-hmm. You know, they wanted me to emulate the style of those, you know, Viagra ads. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's all got to be good news, sorry, and uh, positive, and and of course you've got the disclaimer at the end that tells you to to watch out. Uh, so yeah, and. That get that gets back to having some fun playing mm. with it, going okay, I, I, you know, if they, you know, somebody throws that as a direction at you, you got to be able to go with it. You got right. Yeah, so that, I would just be thinking it'd be so hard to try to do that, knowing what you're what you're doing, what you're about, and trying to be professional at the same time. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, you're still you still laugh a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. you get the job done, but you, st- I think part of it is, is, uh, it's. Part of it is setting the stage to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. And if you go in there all nervous and thinking, oh, the pressure's on, I got oh, it, you're going to be tight. Everybody else is going to be tight. Mm-hmm. So if you go in there and you and you state the obvious, I found if you state the obvious mm-hmm. right off the bat, like, wow, you're one ugly guy. <laughs> People generally yeah. laugh and they go, you know, I am pretty, pretty ugly. Thank you, thank you very much. Now everybody's kind of in sync. We're we're on the same right. page. Now let's get let's get the work done. But it's important to have a good time doing it. Right. Well, it's time, but at the same time, it's important to take that few minutes just to kind of connect a little bit, yep. and so that everybody feels comfortable, and so that the client feels comfortable telling you what what they need to tell you. You feel comfortable. Uh, you know, going in and and trying your best and and getting feedback, both positive and negative. I don't. You know, a lot of actors don't want line readings. I don't care because I I, I understand with a line reading what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to do an exact imitation of you because you're generally probably not going to be able to do it really well. But I'll understand the intent, and mm-hmm. it may be just a matter of you know, putting the emphasis on this or or bracketing that, whatever it might be. Yep. So yeah, so that's a that's a <laughs> that was a that was a fun spot. That was yep. cute. The uh, one of the uh, the the members, and actually several of the members, uh, know a little bit about you, uh, oh, your history and stuff, oh. and and obviously, and and <laughs> oh, one oh. of them. Uh, and I'm going to bring up this picture here. Now, th- this is just a, a current uh, a current one um, okay. that people have asked about, and they wanted to just kind of hear what you had to say about um, uh, doing oh. the uh, doing this show here. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is uh, the young Sheldon, right? This is, this is this is young Sheldon. I am the uh, the mayor of Medford, Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think they were uh, initially planning some more episodes, but then of course, <laughs> you know, COVID hit and everything went. Oh yeah, went exactly. to heck in a handbasket. But yeah, I am the uh, the mayor of Medford, Texas. And this part, you look like a mayor. You really do. That's I, I do. I, you know, it was it was actually my idea to put my uh, my feet up on the uh, the desk there. Here's a funny story. You know, they put you in the mayor's outfit and you go on your debt, you go onto the stage for the first time. And, uh, I put my feet up mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought, Okay, the mayor, the mayor's going to be relaxed. He's a cowboy. Let's have him, uh, put his feet up. And I don't know if you can notice on those bottom of those shoes, but I guess those shoes weren't really 
in great shape. <laughs> it looks like yeah, it looks like there's a little spot on our hole. Yeah, so they they had to come over and do uh do some repairs on the shoes to make them make them look okay. That's but cool. yeah, I got to work with uh, with Ian and uh, and and the gang on 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 Young Sheldon. It's actually one of my favorite shows. It's a really really. So you do get to improvise at times a little bit to make. Hey, it, to on make on it that go. one, no, no. With, with Chuck Lorre, you, you don't really get to improvise very much. Mm. Uh, I've I've worked for uh, for Chuck Lorre quite a few times. I've worked on um, a lot of voiceover. I think I did what fifteen episodes of of Two and a Half Men another seven or eight of Big Bang Theory, one of which I was on camera. And then this show, of course, um, I feel like I'm part of his, you know, rep company. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you don't, you don't mess with his, his dialogue. They, yeah. they are, they're pretty darn funny without you. You don't need to add too much. Yeah, that's great. Um, Tom Burns, one of our uh, members here, Tom, uh, very active in our group. We appreciate him very much. Uh, asked the question about how closely do you, do you follow the curse? I curse of Oak Island story. I mean, do you, do you, do you follow? I mean, in, in my opinion, you'd be probably one of the people that know the most because you read those scripts all the time. So well, you would know everything that's going on. Well, you'd be surprised because when I get the script, it's, it's a, it's a full script. It's got their dialogue in it as well. Uh, so it's a complete transcript of what everybody is saying, but I can't take the time to read what's going on in between. Right. Would take, you know, we'd be there for two plus hours if I'm, right. gonna, you know, read, oh, what are they saying? So I have to just focus on what it is that I'm doing. And then we may, you know, we, so we power through it. So I don't, I get a sense of what I'm talking about, uh, and some of the highlights, but I don't get a, to see a lot of the other stuff that's happening, but I do check in on the show pretty regularly mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's interesting. And number two, I want to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's good to be able to check in, not that I'm listening. Uh, uh, you know, I've fortunately, I've heard myself enough mm -hmm. that I'm not caught up in what I sound like. Right. I'm more thinking about, okay, am I hitting the right beats here? Technically, was I was I pretty good here? Did, did I slur a word, or was was did, did that work? Did I like the way this that sounded? Just technically, just to kind of see whether I'm kind of doing what I what I think I'm doing. Uh, sometimes you think you're great, and you listen back and go, "Oh, what the hell was that?" <laughs> <laughs> so, whoa, man, was I off? But but yeah, so I'll uh, I, I do I do follow follow the story. That's good. Yeah. And, and we kind of figured, like I said, you know, of, of the, of all the people that uh, would be out there, um, you know, knowing a lot about the show, it would be you because you have all that right there in front of you. Oh, uh, you know, Rick and Marty call me all the time. They're they're, they're <laughs> I'm right there at the hub, the center of it all. <laughs> Hardly at all. Like I said, I'm, when I say the last line of defense, that means the last, I'm the <laughs> last guy <laughs> that has anything to say. You know, and that's, uh, you know, we know that you've um, uh, sold some of the scripts that you've done yeah, um, yeah. And you've, with your notes and everything in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An awesome thing to to get a hold of. Uh, many people have talked about it. Are those still available? Are there yeah, any? Yeah, still? Yeah. I've got, I've, on a site called Jemmy, J-E-M-I. Mm -hmm. And I think it's if you go J-E-M-I dot A-P-P. So it's Jemmy dot app. Mm -hmm. You can plug in my, my name. And I do have scripts from oak island these these are these are my personal scripts mm -hmm. uh i've you know maybe have 10 or 15 of them at this point i can't really go back in time because people have bought those but they are the ones that i actually had in front of me that i was saying the words and i'll have little notes that if i can't uh you know pronounce something or need something em emphasized or they've rewritten something i'll do that mm -hmm. and i put a nice little cover on it and put it in a plastic sleeve so it's not just you know here here's something with a paper clip in it no right yeah it, it looks right. really nice and really presentable and then i also have uh a, 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 like some photo and i said i have those for ancient aliens as well and then i have some little you know eight by tens not of a picture of me but of maybe a curse of oak island that i can autograph or ancient aliens that kind of stuff so I've, it's basically stuff that would have been available at conventions but okay. since there are no conventions right now right people still like that and uh so i i i do that and make that available to people i'm also do 
on a site called Cameo, where if somebody wants like a shout out, in fact, I did two of them before we got on, on this call of, uh, you know, my brother is a big fan of Oak Island. Can you wish him a 46th birthday? And I'll, That's I'll do awesome. that. Yep. Mike. Now, how long do you have to keep them before you can let them go? Is there a time? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't sell any scripts that haven't aired. Right. So you want like, so, a, I mean, do you have, do you go by season? Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty much. I mean, the ones that are now, I think it's season eight is where we're at. Yes. And I think they've aired, God, I want to say 12 or 13. And I, I think I've, I, I recorded either episode 20 the other day. So I'm, I'm, we're usually like about four or five ahead of what's, uh, what's airing. Yeah. Susan Otterson had asked that question about uh, the script. Susan, for some reason, that name sounds very familiar. I think I might have sent her a script. Yeah, she did. You did. Oh, yeah. 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 Was, yeah. Yeah. Hello. She bought one of the scripts, and that's why she was asking if, if there was any more uh, available. Oh, I got to send something your way for that nice plug. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> 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 yep, he's a fan. Uh, it, all of us are are fans, of course. You know, like I said, just uh, just hearing your your voice. You know, we all. Uh, you know, uh, well, hopefully it, everybody's not falling asleep. You know, no, I'm not. I'm really. People ask me. They go. People ask me. You know, you don't sound like the guy on TV, and the reason for that is because where the microphone is placed. Mm -hmm. Right now, my microphone is you know I don't know three feet away from me, and I you know, I'm seeing you guys on the screen, so I'm kind of projecting a little bit. But when I'm there in the studio, it's more like, um, let's see. There is an island in the North Atlantic where people have been searching for an incredible treasure for more than 200 years. So it's it's as if I'm kind of just kind of whispering it in your ear. Right. That's and awesome. That's part, of, part of it also, that's part of this technique. It's like, I know the people are right there. I want there to be a one-on-one -on -one connection between me yep. and them. And if I can kind of make that intimate, if I can use the microphone to my advantage and, and, and achieve that, then that's a great thing to do. There's a lot of power in not yelling. Yep. And <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's, it's, it's an association for me. I hear your voice. And the first thing that comes to my mind is Oak Island's coming up. I mean, oh, it's, there you, go. Yep. you know, I mean, it's, it's like, okay, I know what, I know what's on right now. Coming up next right. week. And I, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm looking over here at the chat and there's people like Susan and, and, uh, and they're going, Oh, they got goosebumps right now from what well, you just I, did. I, I, was, <laughs> I was, I was saving that. I, I wanted to do that. And I, but I was saving it for people. Cause I, listen, I'm one of those people. I know what they want to hear. Yep. When I go to these conventions, they all want me to say ancient astronaut theorists say yes, yep. but I'll, tease them a little bit i'm not gonna give it to them right away yeah, exactly you know, let's, ready let's let's have some fun with it we'll, we'll get there don't worry that's awesome oh my goodness um let's see i was just kind of looking back down through some of the notes here oh one gentleman uh derek uh, pierce was asking about um and this goes back to some other stuff that you had done um what was it like working with marvel cinema uh uni uh universe the marvel cinematic universe um, and how did you like being the voice of nick fury's well, he's oh. a badass SUV. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's kind of funny that uh, that kind of fell into my lap because I was doing ADR on mm -hmm. uh, that movie. I think it was Captain America: Winter Soldier. I think that was the one. Mm -hmm. I've done several of the uh, the Captain America movies. Yep. As, as you know, secondary voices, and they needed the voice of Nick Fury's car, and the casting director, who I know and have worked with. That's why he specifically brought me in. He says, hey, you're going to be this. You're this guy. <laughs> and uh, they ended up bringing me back like three or four times just to kind of fine tune it. But it's a very funny scene. If, uh, if people haven't seen it, it's where uh, he's driving around the SUV and he gets blocked in and they, they're assaulting it with with machine guns and rockets, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. And, he's, and I, I'm the guy that says, you know, window integrity, 5%. And he's... <laughs> <laughs> and he's going crazy saying what, you know, or I'll say, this is not online. You know, he'll say, uh, uh, rocket engines, uh, are fully operating and uh, rocket engines, not available. he will say, well, what is working air conditioning at 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, it was, it was uh, fun. A lot of people, uh, it's a great scene. A lot of, yeah. and a lot of people enjoy that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's one of the little Easter eggs that's hidden in there that, uh, if you know me, you're going to go, Oh my goodness, that's Robert. Mm 
That's great. Oh my goodness. Uh, this has been such a wonderful afternoon now uh, having you here. I know it's a, you, we got you up in the, well, not up in the morning, but, um, I, I, I crawled out of bed at about 10 30 AM. Well, being out in California, you know, I mean, I lived in, I lived in San Diego in Southern California for about 12 years and I love the area out there and it's just wonderful. But honestly getting up around, I think you, you're right around Hollywood or you live in that area now, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's a wonderful place. It's just fascinating, but uh, I know, you know, it's, yeah, it's I, I grew up in, in Los Angeles. So it's, 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 it's my home. It's, it's interesting because a lot of people, everybody out here generally is from somewhere else. Uh, you don't really meet a lot of native Angelinos. Mm -hmm. uh, when people do realize you're from here, uh, they're surprised. <laughs> what was it like? So, well, it's was pretty pretty chill. I, I'm used to dealing with traffic. I grew up mm -hmm. with it. And now, you know, you know, sad to say with the, uh, with the COVID lockdown, the one nice aspect of this is that there's no traffic. No, it no, takes don't. me an hour and a half to get somewhere. It takes me 20 minutes. So wow. I don't know how I'm going to be able to go back to the old days when the old days come back, but it's, this is a, a welcome, welcome break. So when I drive into the studio, it's, you know, I can leave the house. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes before I need to be there. And that's, that's gotta be something spectacular because I, I am very familiar. Well, at oh. least it's been a while since I've been in Southern California when I lived there, but man, I just remember the traffic was so bad. Oh, well, I have a friend of mine. The, the worst freeway is, is what we call the San Diego freeway, which is the 405. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, I don't know how he got this license plate past the DMV, but the, the, the last three digits are 405. The first two letters are FN. So it's the FN 405. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, that's just uh, totally, yeah, I'm, I am familiar with the 405. At least, like I said, back when I was living in that area, and I did go up to LA quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I had to work up there oh, in one of our branch offices. And oh my goodness, I just hate it. I thought, oh, do I have to go up there? Oh, okay, all right. And deal with all that traffic and stuff. Well, we're just about ready to wrap it up and um, and and uh, call it a day. And I tell you, this has just been fascinating. Oh, uh, just having you on great. has just been an absolute pleasure. And I knew it would be. Going into this, uh, I just knew that you would have so many good things to share with us. Um, and I was just trying to, and I know a lot of people went by, uh, you know, asking questions in the chat, which we told them, you know, you got to get it to us ahead of time because I'm not going to, you know, when I'm doing an interview like this or a show like this, I don't, I, I try not to look over there too much. That's what I, I keep glancing over here to my left and it's all the, all the, I'm actually looking at the Facebook feed over here and all the chat going by uh, and people are just you know, loving the show and, and really appreciate your coming and joining us today. Um, so I, I guess uh, in, in wrapping this up here, um, we got about six minutes before we get to two hours. Um, you know, we, we were worried about, COVID happening last year. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we talked about that a little bit. And again, also with your experience with it going on there in LA, mm -hmm. but, um, and we're a little bit worried about it again this year. Um, you know, cause we know that uh, here in April, the guys will be showing up on the Island normally and getting things rolling. Have you heard anything? Is it, is it anything? I, and again, I know I might be putting you on the spot here with something you have no idea what's happening there, but have you heard, I mean, is there, you know, how's things uh, affecting that in COVID? It's, uh, I think it, uh, a bit up in the air because it, mm -hmm. it all depends on how, how the whole, I guess, inoculation right. works out. Right. I know that they're starting to, re, you know, reduce some of the restrictions. Mm -hmm. I think Canada, especially in Nova Scotia, I think I read somewhere they've, they've released uh, or, or re reduced uh, a lot of their restrictions. And that's of course is where the guys need to go. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, a lot of the people that are on the show are based up in Canada. So I don't think that is a major problem. It's an issue of, of Rick and Marty getting up there and people that are coming from, uh, you know, stateside. Uh, fingers are crossed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know everybody wants to continue with the show. Uh, nothing is, as far as I know, etched in stone yet, but I have great confidence that, uh, that it will be. Uh, everybody loves it. I think that this last year was kind of a, a rough one mm -hmm. for, not only for people that are dealing with, with, with COVID, but for, for the guys to be able to do what they wanted to do. So I think that they had to kind of put 
you know, on the hold. Big, a lot of the their big dig was put on hold and took right, the big dig, yep. Yeah, so so there's there's work to be done up there, and uh, I know they enjoy doing the show. The fans obviously love it. History Channel couldn't be a bigger supporter of it. Uh, so I have great confidence that we'll we'll be back. But as of when, as right now, you know, I'm, I'm the 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 low man on the totem pole. I'm the, the <laughs> last guy that they, they confer and does, you know, Rick and Marty are not calling me. I'm going, well, what do you think? You think the deal's good? Should I <laughs> time? <laughs> if it were up to me, I'd say, go. Just keep yes, going. Go. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I yeah, got too. So let's keep this, let's keep it going. But uh I I I'm hopeful. And we've already talked a little bit about the possibility of having some conventions at, at some point. It may probably not this year because that's probably a little too optimistic mm -hmm. uh, since it takes a while to to organize those. But hopefully after that and where fans can actually come and talk with us and meet mm -hmm. with us, say hi. And, uh, you know, I love interacting with the fans i'm one of those guys that just goes out in the crowd and just i want i like to meet people i really enjoy that and i enjoy the fact that people are getting a little bit of pleasure from watching the show that it's something that makes them happy and takes a little bit of pressure off of their lives or a little bit of a distraction from all the negative stuff that's happening mm -hmm. and i take that very seriously and uh, my uncle, who my late uncle, who was a, a world champion uh, diver, uh, actually Olympic champion, taught me a great lesson when I was early on because he would sign autographs, and he would say, and I, I'd say, why do you do that? He'd say, well, it's it may not be that important to me, but it's important to them, mm -hmm. and I respect that from the people because. All right there'll become a time when no one will be interested in what I have to say. Uh, so for right now, if they're, if they're interested, I'm, and they want to meet me, let's talk, you know, let's, let's have some fun. Let's make life uh, a little bit more enjoyable. And that's, that's what makes life worth living anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, you, you've come here and you've given me that opportunity to meet you and uh jack and oh you know, I, i've enjoyed it so much thank yep. you and i know that you're you're a member of our group as well so and, yeah. and, and i asked this of all of our guests that we have on the show is that um there will be um there's a lot of comments that have gone by today and and uh and there will be many more because this stays out on youtube it stays out on and you see my little link there and i always like to put that up and so people can see that um but that's the j free 906 is where they're at on on facebook and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, on YouTube and then, of course, in our group. And then a lot of people will watch this after the fact because mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't be here today for whatever reason. So there will be a lot of questions coming later and comments on that. Um, so I always kind of reach out and ask it if you have an opportunity. I know you're a busy man, but if you have an opportunity at some point to look back at some of the comments that were made on the Facebook side, um, and just, you know, if you have something you could add or respond to that, we really appreciate that very much. And so do they. And, and um, pe people can also find me on on Twitter. They can, uh, you know, I I, I, I do, was going to ask you to put that I up. Respond, there. I do respond. I love to interact with people on that. I have a Facebook fan page mm -hmm. that um, people can 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 follow, can throw questions at me. And I love to interact with people. So, yep, that's great. And we, well, and we and really I'm, appreciate I'm, you being I'm, on today. It's been a pleasure. I've got Instagram, but I haven't totally mastered Instagram yet. Yeah, so, me either. But, you know. Now, there was th two things you mentioned. Jemmy, if you don't mind talking, you can mention that again real quick, Jemmy. And if somebody uh, wants shout outs and, and that, go ahead and yeah, bring that up. The app is called Jemmy. So it's Jemmy, J-E-M-I dot A-P-P. And then you do, I guess, forward slash my name and it pop right up. Or you can just go to Jemmy dot app and uh, type my name in. It'll, it'll take to the site. Uh, Cameo, it's just. You know, everybody knows what Cameo is. Just look at Rob Clotworthy, and there I am. Twitter account is Rob underscore Clotworthy. And Facebook is real Robert Clotworthy. And Instagram is just Robert Clotworthy. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Thank this, you. This has been an absolute wonderful afternoon, and I can't thank you enough for coming on the show uh, and, and sharing an afternoon with us and telling us about all this stuff. It's been absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much for that. And, again, I want to thank uh, Jack. 
for being here with us. And uh, you, Linda working so hard. I was watching her. She was out here working, you know, and talking to everybody and and uh, working the chat. And so she does a wonderful job with that. So thank you guys very much. And if you would, Robert, when I sign off here, I ask you to hang out just for just a moment. You don't have to leave okay. right away. But again, thank you guys so much. And if you're watching on YouTube, please, again, I'd like to just say that you see the thing there, uh, JFree906. And if you would, uh, just give us a, a subscribe on there so we can know how we're doing and uh, we can do try to put out better con uh, content for you in the future. So again, thank you members for being here. Appreciate it very much. And again, Robert Clotworthy, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Everybody have a great afternoon. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye. And we are out.